like to go ahead and introduce our authors for the evening. Martin Poussin was born and raised in the Cajun Bayou land of Louisiana. His novel, Black Sheep Boy, a novel in stories, won the Penn Center USA Fiction Award and the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. And it was featured on NPR's The Reading Life and as a Los Angeles Times literary pick and as a book riots must read indie press book. No Place Louisiana, his first novel, was a finalist for the John Gardner Fiction Book Award, and Sugar, his book of poems, was a finalist for the Lander Literary Award for Gay Poetry. He is a professor of creative writing and queer studies at Cal State Northridge. It's my pleasure to welcome Martin Poisson. And Patrick Earl Ryan was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. His work has appeared in the Ontario Review, Pleiades, Best New American Voices, San Francisco Bay Guardian, Men on Men, Best New Gay Fiction for the Millennium, Cairn, and the James White Review. Founder and editor-in-chief of Lodestar Quarterly, Ryan has also taught martial arts philosophy and Tai Chi Chuan for many years. He lives in San Francisco and his debut story collection, If We Were Electric, is the reason we are here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Earl Ryan. I think we're on. Do we start Thank talking you. now? I think is so, it... we're on now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how are you making Patrick? I am making just fine, just fine. Okay. Um, you know it's been quite an experience. <laughs> what was that? I said, because you know that's how we say it in New Orleans. <laughs> how you make it. So make you were it saying well, yeah. It's been quite an experience. Tell me more. Uh, well, just, you know, the, the pandemic has been, uh, has, has given me a, a publishing experience that I wasn't quite expecting for my debut novel. So it's been a challenge, but it's also been, I think, um, a, a little bit interesting in, in the sense that everything is, is virtual now. So I, I wasn't expecting to have to, to do our, everything on Zoom. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. It's been a learning experience. It's been a challenge. It's been, um, it requires a bit of flexibility. Yeah, but, uh, but we're making it work. You from New Orleans, that's what we do. We make it work, right? And, <laughs> and a debut is a debut is a debut, right? And I, uh, as I said to you in an email, I'd rather trade places with you. I think it's an exciting moment to be right here at the start of your publishing career. And it's a thrilling book. Congratulations on the Flannery O'Connor Prize. That is extraordinary. Thank and you. you're welcome, very well deserved. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we have a, a couple of dirty jokes about Flannery. Uh, in Southern Louisiana. Um, often we riff on the title of her most famous story, a good, a good man is hard to find. So it's a hard man is good to find, right? <laughs> and that's, that's probably what Evie thought in Before Las Blancas. Uh, 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 I wanna quickly, so I really do wanna just throw um, all the praise I can on you. I think it's a riveting uh, collection. It's an exciting story. And even though many of them were written um, as long ago as late 90s and early aughts, it feels utterly contemporary. You know, I feel like time has collapsed in this collection and it's remarkable that you achieve that effect and we may talk about that a little bit. Uh, I wanna quickly off to the side say to anyone uh, listening and watching now, um, merci beaucoup to Carr. Uh, I want to let you all know that CSUN, California State University of Northridge, would not have a pride center were it not for Carr, who in 2010 came to me and said, we have no safe space on this large campus of 30,000 students. Carr fought for two years against all odds, including the administration, the provost, and the president, until finally in 2012, that late, but we finally did get a safe space at pride center at CSUN. And I remind those students every time I visit that place that Carr was at the forefront of that effort. So uh, thanks, Carr. Um, so uh, Patrick, um, what's your mom and daddy name? And can your mama make a root? <laughs> I, um, well, I'm named 
after my mom and my dad both. So I was the last of five sons. And so I was named Patrick after my mom, Patricia, and my middle name is Earl, which was my dad's name. Um, I'm the, their fifth child, although I am my dad's eighth child because my dad was married six times. <laughs> so, um, so uh, yeah, I turned out exactly the way I should um, because of that history. Um, so let's see, you, you said uh, a roux. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my mom can make a pretty good roux, but I have to say, I think I make a better roux than my mama. <laughs> Ooh, that's dangerous talk now. All right. <laughs> um, now, um, we know this because we're from Southern Louisiana, right? Um, but neither one of us are actually white, as in American white, Anglo white, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm Cajun, you're Creole. Uh, for those who don't know, would you tell us a little something about Creole, being Creole? What is that? Sure. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, so a lot of people actually think that Cajun and Creole are basically the same thing, mm -hmm. um, which is not the case for those of you who don't know that. Um, although I do have a bit of Cajun blood in me. So on my mom's side of the family, uh, Acadians uh, the from Quebec came down in the uh, mid 1700s, uh, went to Plaquemines Parish. So on my mom's side, I do have some of that blood. My dad's side, what he used to call uh, a Heinz 57 background, um, is basically uh, five different continents that my blood is from. A, a Creole, in the, the strictest sense, is basically uh, back in the, at least in the, the beginnings of New Orleans, uh, Creole would be anyone who was born in New Orleans, uh, who were a mix of the French or Spanish, along with the Native Americans there and Black blood. Um, and so uh, there's that mixture that's important for to be considered Creole. Um, uh, as it progressed, you know, the French basically bought out the Spanish. And um, so it, it came to be known as the French speaking area of New Orleans uh, to the to the east of Canal Street uh, or later to the east of Esplanade Avenue. Um, and so in that Faubourg Marigny neighborhood was the Creole section of New Orleans. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what it what it was is this mix of French, Spanish, Black, Native American. Throw whatever you want in there. It's kind of like a jambalaya. Uh, you know, that's 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 what it is. Creole. That's right, or a good gumbo, right? Uh, the fact that you have some Cajun and you've just elevated you in my mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, the. Uh, Many people don't know that part of this heritage that you're talking about has to do with the fact that uh, there were free people of color uh, decades before the Civil War in New Orleans and the third uh, neighborhood to form the Treme was populated with Jean de Couleur and Libra. Um, and yes. you, 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 um, you, know, you season your stories uh, with some French, which reminds me that um, as a Tulane uh, historian said, in Louisiana, French is not a foreign language, right? It's if Juno Diaz can talk about Spanglish in Oscar Wilde, then you can talk about Franglais in your book. And there are a lot yes. of terms that come uh, at us in your stories. Um, uh, so I, just a couple of them. Um, what is a pichuanque? <laughs> now that that is um, <laughs> that is more of a uh, Cajun term, isn't it? it? It is. Do you know that term? <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, you know, I'd have to defer to you on what the exact definition of that is, um, because it's just, for me, it's just like something that you would, it's kind of like a calling somebody something cute, you know, that it would, you know, that you would just say like a little child. Um, so, it's, so. It's like a little pecan, like a yeah. little pecan, right? Um, that little cute thing off to the side. Uh, yeah. So it was a term of endearment, basically, that I heard it as. Also, Fufole, uh, which is not just a word in a story, but the title of a story. What is that? Yes. Um, so I'm very interested in folklore. Um, and I'm also interested a lot in voodoo, but not necessarily in practicing voodoo, but how we grow up in New Orleans and we have voodoo surrounding us. And so it becomes part of our, our um, vocabulary, in a sense, without even knowing what many things are. 
Um, although I do with, with faux filet, um, faux filet is basically these mysterious little lights um, that you would see out in the woods. Um, and and there was fortune attached to them in some way. So, um, you, you know, you might see them out in the swamps or whatever it happens to be. So they're magic lights. Um, you know, I, I would always, I would go out to the woods in Mississippi quite often um, and, and do acid and, and get drunk. And, <laughs> and sometimes you'd see um, fireflies out there, you know, and I would always think, I wonder, you know, I wonder if that was, if that was where this, this came from, you know, where people saw fireflies and, and they were like, that's what they put it to is this, this kind of superstitious idea. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a supernatural element to those. Um, yeah. There you go, exactly. You know, the, the dull answer is that uh, it's phosphorescence, right? I mean, that's the dull scientific answer. And the body <laughs> naturally has phosphorescence, but then you throw in oil and, you know, everything else in the environment. Uh, but really what Creoles and Cajuns think is that fufule, uh, you know, little um, sprites or elves are more to the point fairies, right? That are at the perimeter of our vision and they're sparking um, magically for us. So. Um, speaking of sparking magically, you mentioned voodoo. I will just show everyone that I'm casting a little voodoo for you and the great success of If We Were Electric Now. And to further add to the voodoo, I'm hoping you might be willing to read a little something uh, to give us a, a taste, a little flavor of the book. I would, I would love to, yeah. Okay. Uh, I've been thinking about what I should read. And so um, I think because I haven't ever had the chance to read the title story. Um, I thought I'd read just maybe the first couple of pages from that, not too much, just to give a sense of the language of the book and and um, and how it feels. Um, Carr had mentioned earlier that it's uh, you know the, the great autumn or fall read uh, or book to buy, but I really think of of the book as a summer book. You know, I think that there's so much heat in the book, um, and this is a good example of that. You know, there's thunderstorms throughout. Um, humidity, all of that, that, that kind of gives a good sense of New Orleans. So I'll read a little bit of that. Um, this is the title story, If We Were Electric. It's by the Royal Street Grocery, walking in warm and fat rain, when I first see the boy named Mark. He'll take away more than one thing in my life. How many times had I walked this exact street wishing for something similar. I'm spending the day looking for books. In the back of my mind, I'm looking for men. I'm still a virgin at 21. He waits on top of a blue city garbage can, long legs beating against metal, drinking straw hung from his bottom lip. He's looking for men too. A man, a French sailor with short legs and full uniform, struts out of the grocery's white swinging doors, and Mark, although I don't know his name yet, is vying for attention. He keeps the sailor within hungry eyes, enough for me to recognize lust and begin to possess, possess it myself. A low shake inside the gut when he opens his legs wider, pulls his red shorts away from skin, revealing the bare white of his inner thigh. He's pure grit, but the sailor is daydreaming of other things. Means a woman in Paris, his ship. I'm counting money or pretending I am, my head down even while my eyes are up. If I keep walking, I won't talk to him. If I stop, then I'll be at a loss for words. We are both adolescence in some respects, lacking adult candor, but it will work itself out, I decide. It's a must do. Out of the nickels and quarters, he is a blooming face, fierce eyes, lips that could bite back and scar above his right cheek, rising out of my palm. I'm in love with him like this. Here, while I'm wishing, the sailor pulls an umbrella from the grocery bag and opens it. Then off he dashes down Royal Street. Mark, the still nameless conspiracy of bumbling limbs that he is, lops down from the top of the garbage can more gracefully than I ever could and stands 
a monument in the middle of the sidewalk, gazing at the sailor one final time, a departing blue figure in misty rainfall. Women and men pass and bump the boy out of their way. I walk up behind him and the dark haired Randy boy who will be Mark turns to me, pulls the straw out of his mouth and smiles, big white teeth everywhere. Don't worry, I'm used to this kind of weather, he tells me, and just as quick turns and follows his oblivious sailor. I'll stop there. I'm so glad you read that part because it's so hot, right? It's, you talk about heat uh, and temperature, but also just so sensual and so much of the writing is incredibly sensual. Uh, uh, I, you know, in thinking about the book as a whole, I was imagining as it would be taught, someone might think of these stories as experimental, but I don't think they're experimental because if they're experiments, they succeed brilliantly. And I don't think of it as experimental so much as, you know, unconventional, but then it's only unconventional if we think about American storytelling, which is, you know, based on rationalist, Calvinist, Protestant, uh, you know, um, problem solution axes, right? These stories often work that way, and, and, but yours don't, right? They run counter that. Um, the stories are almost inevitably fragmented. Uh, in structure, there's ample use of uh, ruptures and white space and glyphs um, to separate these fragmented episodes. Um, yet the collection holds together as exactly that. It's a collective experience of a myriad of characters through an expanse of time, but with a coherent voice and a coherent purpose. Um, the boundaries in this book, I thought were interesting because they're not about boundaries of state or city or parish or race, um, so much as they are uh, boundaries of, uh, and they're not even boundaries of the body, but they're boundaries of the mind. Uh, the coherence seems to arise out of a kind of psychological probity in this book. And it seemed to me your aim was to put forward these seriously flawed people who are both flawed and yet perfect. Um, there's a, an incredible amount of sort of hard mercy and tough grace uh, in these stories. And um, as a whole, they shouldn't work, these stories, but they do, right? I mean, there's a little to no plot. There's often no cause effect with some sort of logical motivation. There's often no clear antagonist unless it's a hurricane. Uh, the stories are not interlocking. They don't share a narrator. There's no single protagonist or point of view. Um, they don't always share a theme, but, but, they always share a setting. In one way or another, um, the stories arise out of, escape from, or return to New Orleans. So it ends up being almost like a travel log, um, which seems like ideal for our readers who are trapped in their homes right now, right? And they wanna get out and they wanna go somewhere new <laughs> and utterly different. And that's what you offer, Patrick. It's, it's utterly distinct, it's utterly New Orleans, it's redolent with the place. So I wanted to know, um, as a seventh generation New Orleanian, was this your strategy? Did you decide I'm writing a whole collection that will be interconnected in one way only, New Orleans? Or is New Orleans just that bitch that commanded you to write only about her? Which is it? I would have a hard time separating those two because I think they're <laughs> both true. Um, I will say that um, there are quite a number of, of influences uh, in the book, literary influences. And one of the um, obvious ones for me when I look at the story collection on a whole would be James Joyce's Dubliners mm -hmm. um, in the sense that he is taking a city and, and that this is the effect, this is the power of the city on the people. Um, and so for me, this was also what I wanted to convey in the book, that there is a power of New Orleans uh, that it exerts upon its citizens. So even when you have a narrator say, in I wouldn't say no, who is in London, uh, there is this magnetism that is pulling him back to New Orleans, that it won't let you go. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, 
it's the swamp, right? This, this swamp is dragging you down into its mud, into its dirt. Um, and that, that was important for me to convey that because personally, it was difficult for me to get out of New Orleans, um, even though now I just want to go right back. It's this draw and pull and, and, and push that, that keeps happening. Um, so yes, I think that New Orleans itself is what spoke, or I shouldn't say spoke, but yelled <laughs> for me to write this um, and to write it in that way. Uh, New Orleans is the connection between each of these stories or at least the vicinity of New Orleans. They don't all take place, like Faux Filet is outside of New Orleans, but, but it is the connection between them. And the title itself, if we were electric, kind of, you know, there's a little bit of that where that is what's connecting everything. It's just electricity that the city itself has that pulls everything together, um, that connects it and keeps it connected. Um, yeah. Your, your adoration for the place is, you know, intoxicating um, and utterly seductive, and yet you live in San Francisco. Do you, mm -hmm. do you think that distance is part of what, you know, infuses and empowers your storytelling about a place in which you don't currently live? I think that it, it is, you know, I, all of the stories were written outside of New Orleans. So they, they were written once I had come to California, once I'd come to San Francisco. Um, in a way, they are representative of my yearning for New Orleans. They were a way of me possessing the city without being able to live there. I would live there. I would love to live there. But, you know, life brings us into different places and we just have to do what we can to, to get by, to live. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult city in the sense of of bearing the weather. <laughs> um, so, so in that way, I think that this was my way of, of remaining a New Orleanian um, because I do have a deep love for the city. And I do go back. I haven't been able to go back this year, but I, I in the past, I would go back every year. And it was important for me to go back and touch New Orleans every year because I think that it refuels me to a certain degree. Um, you know, when I go back, I, I've, I've spoken about this before that I'm, I'm kind of an introvert, which is odd for a New Orleanian, you know, to be an introvert. Um, but I think it's because I'm out here because every time I go back to New Orleans, as soon as I step foot off of the airplane, as soon as I get into a cab or an Uber, I'm completely an extrovert again. And, and my voice comes back and I just, I'm in love with the city um, and, and it comes out and it just comes out of all my pores. Um, did I get off point? <laughs> no, 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 you're right on point. I mean, what you're saying is they speak the language, right? We, we, we share a language and um, like a couple of coons, when we were first introduced to each other by email, we had to root around in each other's garbage and we discovered that we, <laughs> near, we near missed each other, right? In New Orleans, <laughs> in Lafayette, but also in San Francisco by just a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, back to New Orleans, because really that's where we always want to get to. Um, I, I thought another, there are a lot of surprises in this, in this collection. Uh, one of the surprises is that although there's this utter fascination with New Orleans, the stories are populated with people that aren't always from New Orleans or even from the US. So you mentioned London, we have Chinese, Japanese, Czech, uh, New Zealand um, here. And I, I wondered, was that part of a strategy? You know, New Orleans is often thought of as like the, the sine qua non of regionalism and parochialism, like that's all you know, right? But anyone who knows New Orleans knows that it's incredibly international and it once vied with New York for you know, capital, European capital of the West. So were you trying to sort of push against that parochial view of the city by you know, purposely populating your stories with people who were from other places or other backgrounds yes. and personalities, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if it was completely conscious as I was writing them, but as they were written and were finished and I started looking at them as a whole, I certainly saw that and I certainly understood it as something that I thought about my city. I, growing up, I would always think of New Orleans as com 
completely separate from the South. I'm like, this is this isn't the South. We're not the South in New Orleans. You guys are the South. We're not the South. We're like this little European city that's you know tucked away from from everyone else. You know, if you look at even just um, voting records, right? How people vote in Louisiana. You have the entire state basically red, but then you have New Orleans and it's blue. And and so there is this internationalism. Um, it's always been that way. It was the third largest city in America during the 1800s, if not the richest, one of the richest cities. Um, people came from all over. Looking at myself, just as an example of what New Orleans is, I was saying my ancestors come, come from five continents. So, you know, one lineage from my dad's side is, is Filipino boat jumpers. They escaped from the Spanish ships in the early 1800s and became shrimpers in Barataria Bay, uh, which is to the east of the city. Um, so, so, you know, you have all of these. Um, another example is, you know, I, I have four brothers, they're all straight. Um, and one, one of my brothers um, married a Cambodian uh, immigrant who came to uh, New Orleans in the early 70s. She was a refugee. Um, there's also a large Vietnamese community in New Orleans East as well. So I grew up seeing Asians everywhere. They were close to my family, close to the culture. Um, you, you know, it wasn't anything strange to see people from all over the world in New Orleans. And I think that makes it different than the rest of the South. At least I always felt that it made it different than the rest of the South. That, that, uh, you know, I, nothing was a surprise to me. Yeah, that streetcar always seemed to have a great um, desegregating effect on the city, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, first uh, city in the U.S. with an opera house, first apartment building, first public bar, and some even say first public gay bar with the original Lafitte's. Um, yes, but that's true. <laughs> right? But I'm glad you mentioned your straight brothers because one of the many surprises in this book is that although um, the book is mostly homosocial, concerned with men and boys, mostly behaving badly, but it's not homosexual, not explicitly. I mean, there's a big embrace here of, you know, all masculinity, liminal masculinity and otherwise. And uh, readers might be surprised, for example, to know that the story that is most, most explicitly concerned with HIV AIDS uh, features a straight character who has HIV AIDS. Uh, and so um, I, I thought it interesting to go back and look at the beginnings of the stories and all but two of them work along these lines. This is the first sentence for the most part. Men, in, uh, we have the very first full phrase really is I could smell him. Then, so I punched him square in the nose. During his nighttime walk, he believed. My brother's ghost. I'm in love with Kent. Uh, three men lived in the last house. He wasn't the sort to keep secrets. I first see the boy named Mark. I haven't told you about my real brother. And finally, he expected a thunder's mighty rumble. So when I look back and looked at the collection as a whole, I started wondering about you know, in addition to, you know, making the stories populated with this international view of the city, were you also trying to really, you know, hone in and focus on what it means to be male and masculine in a place like New Orleans, which is completely distinct from being male and masculine in the rest of the country? I, in this sense, in this particular question, I would say that this is reflective of my own personal history. Um, so growing up with four brothers, no sisters, um, my father and my mother, my mother was my only feminine uh, role model, my only feminine connection. I, I went to a Catholic school for grammar school and for high school. My high school was all boys. Uh, so my connection with the world was through a masculine lens. Um, you know, that, that was what I experienced. I, I didn't have close friends who were female. Um, you know, I, I have friends now who accuse me of being afraid of women, <laughs> which I'm not. You know, I mean, I, I think that that uh, it's just one of those things where what, who you have around you becomes the friends that you have. Um, so, so in that sense, I think part of it is personal experience, and that's why it's so focused on the masculine, um, because that is, if anything, this collection represents a particular decade for me. 
And that decade was obsessed with masculinity, obsessed with men, you know, the crushes that I had, um, my family, you know, these are, these are all things that are present in, in, in those men that are in the stories. They are, yeah, they're based on, on either real people or on versions of real people. And the, I should make clear that your, your, your book has such a wide embrace that women are there. It's just that, you know, men are the anchor and men are the, the protagonists invariably. But the book does start with a boy trying to leave his mother. And then it ends with a man trying to, in one way or another, return to his female lover. Uh, and so it was an interesting arc there. And I've often thought about the fact that our culture really is almost more matriarchal than it is patriarchal and you know the seat of power so i wonder if that's why sometimes we feel contested you know in our gender roles um it's a fascinating part of the book uh and i admired it i also really admired um the superstructure because again in a book that doesn't have more of the obvious uh uh interlocking interconnected points um you had to have and it's evident you really thought about how to arrange and sequence it all so that it would have a totalizing effect and I, I, when I reached the end and we had the mandatory evacuation in a story whose title is Tempest, right, an approaching hurricane, it led me to go back to the beginning. And when I looked at Before Las Blancas, I saw, okay, you've got two men or a man and a boy who are driving down hurricane evacuation route, <laughs> right, a road away from New Orleans. That's where it starts. But then it ends with one man answering a call of a woman and thinking and pondering how long to New Orleans by canoe or by foot. And of course, I thought of Fast Dominoes walking to New Orleans there. Uh, but <laughs> right, that's how it starts and it ends. And you've got in the beginning, you know, fat mosquitoes and singing locusts and the Achafalai swamp. And then in the end, you've got this overgrown flooded swamp, you know, and, you know, sea foam. Um, it starts with the smell of semen, it ends with the sight of blood. Um, so it seems well, like, I don't necessarily say it's semen. No, no, but I figured that out on my own, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could smell him. I kind of, you know, I, I just use my own personal history to figure that one out. Uh, but, you know, it, you know, here you go. I mean, it, it ends up having this incredible superstructure and art. So I wondered what, to what degree, when you started putting together all these stories, did you intend that effect and if so what then was the strategy what are you trying to you know say to us about the experience of all these men in this place new orleans i think that the structure is subtle um so so I, it was purposeful but it was subtle and i spent a lot of time rearranging seeing how i i liked the stories arranged for, for the book. Um, but for example, you know, in a very obvious way, we start with Before Las Blancas because it is the youngest narrator of the collection. Um, it is kind of this flowering, uh, this birth of like, you know, as far as springtime, um, where something is flowery coming out of the ground, um, his awakening. Um, but for example, I, I like the idea of mirroring so you have in the collection quite a few stories that mirror each other. So for example, we have the story of the blue sun, which is the story of a mother and two brothers. Um, and then later we have where it takes us, which says, oh, this is the story of my real brother. You know, I haven't told you about my real brother. So it's almost as if the narrator of the entire collection is saying, oh, I'm a storyteller. I was telling you a fib before, but this is the real version. And of course, neither is the actual real version, but, but that there's these connections that mirror each other in that way. Um, yeah, so, so, so it was important for me to act at least to have those spaced apart from each other so that you had a, a chance to then notice that reflection. If they were right next to each other, I think that would be too obvious. I want that, ref I want that to come to the reader in a more natural way rather than it being just kind of pushed into their face. Um, I'm just trying to think of, of other examples. Uh, I, my mind is getting old, <laughs> but, but now and then ca cars are very important throughout the entire collection. So you'll see that cars actually come up 
again and again through each story. So there's, um, I think it's in blackout. And then uh, maybe it's referring back to the cargo, but there's a car that passes on the roadway in one of the stories, which is the same car that is in the actual story of the other. So that there's these little connections that happen that, um, that even though the stories may seem very disjointed and very disconnected, they do rope through um, each other in that way, in subtle ways. Well, New Orleans is a city of masking, right? And, and one part of the beauty of your book is that it's never over, it's never direct, it's never didactic, right? And uh, its faces are always changing. It's, it is subtle, but it's also wonderfully arcane and mysterious. And so I only come to these conclusions because I have to sit there and reflect on it. It's not that you're broadcasting all of this. And I think that's part of the power of the writing. You allow us to do some of that work, right? Um, I, I think in part, the superstructure ends up saying that you know, in Southern fiction, especially Southern Louisiana, um, place is always the shadow protagonist. And if that's the shadow protagonist, then in a way, uh, memory is the antagonist because nothing uh, marks place or spikes it more than the smell of it. And your book has so much of the funky order of New Orleans, right? And it seemed to be a way to gin up memory and have that memory, you know, clashing with place. Uh, and the story spin out of that. Um, I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, is that not the way the rest of the world is? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's only New Orleans, only. Um, you mentioned uh, possession earlier, and um, I was interested also in the fact that these stories are usually in one way or another about severance, about death, um, but not death the way it would be in the rest of the, the, the nation, you know, not an Anglo sense of death as in it permanent, right? Instead, you have a lot of living deaths, you have a lot of ghosts. And so I, I wondered if you'd say a little something about the dual meaning of possession in New Orleans, because it's not a single meaning there, right? It's always a dual meaning. So possession in, in terms of death and memory, I'm assuming you mean. And, and spirit. Um, and spirit, yeah. So, so you know, the the stories that come to mind, you know, when you look at Faux Filet, um, that's a good example. And that that is actually right next to the Blue Sun. And both of those deal with this idea of possession um, and death and spirit. Um, in that the so, for example, the mother in the Blue Sun um, is so overwrought, uh, so. Um, refuses to, to allow her son who has died for that memory to leave, um, that, that his ghost then possesses the, the, the entire house. Um, in the same way that in Fofile, you have the old man who has lost his daughter and it's um, that memory possesses him in that same way. So memory as a way of possession, I think is what, what uh, what was my intention, at least, for a lot of those stories? Um, you know, I think in a larger sense, you look at New Orleans and, and look at how the city itself possesses the people who live there. And, you know, there's, there's such a history with New Orleans and a, such a diverse history that I feel that too, that it possesses you in the same way. So I was very interested in, in examining that and, and how people can't get away from those spirits from those ghosts that, that kind of haunt them, uh, even though the time has passed or the people have passed, whatever it happens to be. The, the possessions also are uh, sometimes um, sexual, of course, right? And uh, one of the, the elements that really fascinated me with this book was the way in which everyone ultimately is, forgiven and but it doesn't even feel like that's called for because there's such an embrace of these characters and such a an uh an overwhelming sense of affection for them all coming from the narrator which you know ultimately is you you mentioned that it's autobiographical of course and i thought of how powerful it is fiction you know it's not rhetoric it's not about persuasion it's more of an 
art of seduction. And you're so incredibly seductive that when we read the first book, we might forget that it's a, ro a romance of a 13 year old boy and a 28 year old man, but we don't think of words like pederasty, right? There's no sense of indictment or crime, although this would be a criminal act in really every state in the country, you know, is, is a minor. Um, and, you know, I felt like you, you really worked to have us um, so seduced with this world and these characters that we dropped our usual moral framing um, and instead adopted a, a more truly moral framing. And that is an awareness and awakening to the fact that if you're truly alive, if you're truly beating and smelling and sensing, then you are always fucking up. You are always behaving badly, but each bad step is a step that moves you forward. And that in this book, we're always moving forward, ultimately to grace. There's always fufule. There's always light at the end in your stories. Uh, the plots are sinewy, um, they're forked, like all the little um, uh, waterways around New Orleans. But there's often this burst, like you know, uh, the coronary system. And there are passages even that's, that have uh, the, the fierce, the familiar grip of a tender heart, right? And I felt like that's, that's the ultimate triumph of this book that um, through all of the murk and mud uh, and the mystery of New Orleans, at the end, what you really deliver is an incredibly light, powerful and majestic sense of what it means to be human in a place as topsy-turvy as New Orleans. And right now in this country, we're all living in a topsy-turvy place. And so you really offer all of us this chance at, you know, redemption. And you're always forgiven. Yes. Right, that's, that sense of always being forgiven. You know, it's, it's a tricky business when you're dealing with, say, pedophilia. Um, and I think that would be a completely different story, of course, if it was told from Neil's point of view. But what is the what is the important viewpoint in that story is that it's coming from Mevi's point of view, and what we have instead is we all know what it feels like to be in love. We all know what it feels like to long for something, to desire something. Um, so it just it it keeps its bearings by focusing on those emotions that he's having, um, that desire that he's having, and desire, of course, is something that goes throughout the entire book. Um, you know. Not, not, not always sexual desire. Yes, and if we are not to behave badly and if we're to be forgiven by, by, by Carr, we should turn this over to, <laughs> to the, your readers and your fans for some questions, right? I, that sounds great I to encourage me. you both to behave badly, please. This has been a wonderful <laughs> hour. Thank you so much. Um, Patrick, so humbling your book it's just so good um and i i agree that i did say it was for fall but and you said it was for summer but i think it's really a book for all seasons <laughs> <laughs> um we do have a couple of questions i wanted to say oh thank you thanks folks great questions um i would be remiss if i didn't mention very briefly that uh I would not be the queer person I am today or a writer today uh, without the presence of Martin Pouzon in my life and for his earnest care um, for his students and uh, for his humanity. That's a truth. So let's see. Uh, well, Aaron has a comment here that just says, this is good. I agree, Aaron. Uh, then Mike asks, Patrick, at the end of Cargo, did you get much pushback about the point of view shift in its final paragraphs when it was originally published? So the Cargo is an interesting story um, because it didn't always end the way that it ends in the book. Um, so initially there was a point of view change where we switch from um, the point of view we have for the entire story um, you know, the, the young boy in that story. And we switched to the wedding singer at the end. 
But mm -hmm. what changed was I didn't want to switch the point of view. So it's interesting that they're saying that there's a point of view switch. Um, was it Mike? Is that the person who asked the question? Uh, Mike Kiggins. Yes. Okay. So, um, so at the end, what my intention was, uh, was that this is um, reincarnation. So that what yeah. happens at the end there is actually the boy dies, but then there's a rebirth and he is born and he sees the lights of, of uh, the hospital room and he's taken into his mother's arms. Um, and that's kind of felt, felt like a much, it, it felt more in line with the rest of the book. So that idea of forgiveness and that idea of redemption mm -hmm comes through a little bit more clearly in that way for the for the for the that particular story because that's a rough story you know there's a lot of violence in that story and I'm very interested in that sort of um I think it's because of my because of Flannery O'Connor actually that 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 sort of we can even look at a good man is hard to find which was an influence on the cargo as well as a another Paul Bowles story that uh is about two uncles that are traveling through the desert with their nephew and they get murdered <laughs> by another tribe of Arabs and then the boy is actually um, castrated and then his penis is put into his stomach. Um, uh, it's, it's, that's Paul Bowles, I guess he was smoking a lot of pot at the time. Um, <laughs> but, but that the cargo actually kind of is playing off of both of those stories. And, and instead of having it be, say with Flannery O'Connor, you have this sort of idea of judgment. At the end, I wanted that idea of redemption instead and forgiveness at the end something light the light coming through yeah hmm. thank you um i have a question here it's exciting this is from matt carney who is also a former green appler uh hi martin former 1718 member here only reading series to get rated by new orleans abc and you certainly changed my life by putting me in touch with press street Patrick, I know you were involved with 14 Hills at um, San Francisco State, for those who aren't familiar, and I'm sure you've done the same for plenty of students in San Francisco. Could you both talk more about how being involved in these projects and students' uh, balances with informs, distracts from your work? Uh, sure, I can talk a little bit about that. When I was at SF State, um... So not only was I an editor for 14 Hills, um, but I also started a reading series there for queer writers called Queer Words, which ran most of the time that I was actually at State, where I brought in a lot of, um, you would have uh, teachers who were queer as well as students who were queer. And it gave them that, that chance to actually read together um, so that you had an event where you would have a mix of people who've been in the profession for many years and people who were just starting to write. Um, and so it gave them that platform where you'd have more of an audience than you might have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I did a bit of that, but I think the editing that I did with 14 Hills and the work that I did with other students, for me, um, many times just detract, uh, distracted from my own work. So it was, a, it was a, sometimes difficult to maintain that. Mm -hmm. So when you look at my writing progress, you'd see that there were these areas, okay, well, in this area, I'm, I'm editing and that's all I'm doing. And then I'd have to be away from it for, for a little while and then to go back to writing so that they were separate entities. They had to be separated in time and to a certain degree um, because I would give my all when I would do editing work or if I was working with queer students, uh, for example. Um, not to say that it wasn't beneficial, because I think then it did inform my own writing. I think my, my skills were honed um, through working with uh, editing with uh, other students and, and with queer writers. I, I worked with Lodestar Quarterly as well. That was, uh, you had mentioned earlier. So I did editing work with, with uh, that journal and it was the same thing where it was very hard to kind of do them at the same time, writing and editing, but separately they then, I was able to maintain it and they would, inform each other and, and assist each other. Martin, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. This question is about writing uh, while teaching and running reading series and the like, working with students. Oh, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> uh, 
all I'll say is, you know, what's, what's tough is that, you know, at CSUN, um, I teach four classes and I'm up to about 130 students a semester. And, you know, quickly do the numbers and you can see, um, and as Cora knows, I often work with students outside of class in various ways. That's what's hard, you know, as it is, I started um, writing Black Sheep Boy in 2004 in New Orleans um, before uh, Katrina hit. Um, and it was taken out of my hand in 2017. Um, my joke is that it took me 13 years to write 13 stories. That was my pace. And now I don't know how I'm gonna produce any more because I'm no longer a junior faculty member. So there are no, you know, course releases or time off. I will be teaching this load, you know, for another decade or more. That's the hard part of it. Um, but the, the remarkable part, the rewarding part is um, not just looking at what I might be able to produce in a book or a set of stories, but what students can produce. And I think with 1718, what Matt would invariably remember is the uniqueness of that reading series was that we didn't set it up to promote a writer with a new hot book out. In fact, we almost never had a writer who had a new release. Instead, we had writers as disparate as um, James E. Burke or uh, John Biganay or Ernest Gaines, Andre Codrescu and Poppy Zebright. And it was more like a career retrospective and you know, their books we were celebrating, them as writers we were celebrating. And we didn't just have them spotlit in the former bordello of the Columns Hotel, right? uh, uh, old, old whorehouse. Uh, we also had um, writing student writers and they read alongside these established acclaimed writers. And I thought, that was a fully appropriate. Everyone embraced that and really sh showcased their abilities. And, and since then, I've seen, for example, Catherine Lacey um, was Lacey Booth at the time, and she helped establish uh, 1718. Catherine Lacey has now won the Guggenheim Fellowship, has four books out, is major, and she was one of my Katrina kids. Um, Right. And, uh, you know, uh, most recently, she, she went to Columbia. Um, most recently, um, a student from CSUN, Kash Kabushani, um, a queer first generation Persian uh, American student, um, just graduated from Columbia. And his book just sold after competitive bidding for a major six figure deal, like 90s money, Patrick, 90s money, right? <laughs> also sold to uh, a press in. Uh, England being adapted to a film. And these are just like two of the high points. I have so many students who are doing great work out in the world. If it's not publishing books, it's running bookstores, uh, book series, working as editors uh, uh, and, and community activists as well. And so that's the great reward in the end is to realize, I think part of what Patrick says in his book, if we were electric, that we really are. And ultimately, we are the stories we tell ourselves. So whether I'm writing a story that's going to be published or whether my students are, you know, and, and in the end, it's one and the same to me because, mm -hmm. you know, it is a series of electric charges and one way or another, we're all speaking in union. And so that's what it's like to me to teach and write simultaneously. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, one more question. Uh, there's, this is about the design of the, of the book, Patrick, of the cover of your book. And oh, yeah. what's, what's so interesting about um, this, so this is at, is it St. Rock in New Orleans? St. Rock Cemetery, that's the mm -hmm. chapel of prosthetics at St. Mm -hmm. Rock Cemetery. That is also yeah. uh, coincidentally where my dad and my grandparents are buried at St. Rock Cemetery, wow. which the, the person who designed the book did not know that. They found this photograph and it was just kind of, oh, what do you think of this? And it mm -hmm. came up and um, I was like, wow, you realize what you've just done? <laughs> so yeah, my, my, uh, my dad and my grandparents are buried at that cemetery. Yeah. What, what fate, what kismet, that's so interesting. Cause you know, I'm me and I'm, I'm sure um, this is my question. So I'm asking you, <laughs> me and um, everyone watching, um, I'm, concerned with the book is object 
And I do think design is important. And I think we should judge books by their cover because books should be designed beautifully, but you know. Um, so I, in thinking of the kind of disembodied pieces and the embodied pieces happening at the same time, and this is a story collection, I just thought it was so brilliant. And I was wondering if that was a concern going in, if it was a form and function thing. And, but to hear your answer now that it also has a personal connection to you. Is it does, lovely. yeah, it's a personal connection. And, you know, I had a great fear going into this because I didn't have control over the cover. I didn't know what was gonna happen. I didn't mm. know if I was gonna wind up with a male torso on my cover, you know, uh, which I was hoping wouldn't happen. Um, and it just, it was beautiful to see this. And when I saw it, it just kind of took my breath away. I brought mm. back so many memories because, you know, my dad died when I was 15. My grandparents died before I was born. And the way that I got to know my grandparents was to go to the cemetery and to visit the graves. We would go every year, the day after Halloween, you know, we'd go and bring flowers, All Souls Day, All Saints Day. Um, and so that's how I knew them, was actually visiting the ground where they were buried. So this, this was, was remarkable to see this happen. The book was also released on what would have been my dad's 109th birthday, September 15th. Mm -hmm which had nothing to do with me either. It was just this, this, the way the universe spoke uh, to me and to the world for this. Yeah, it was just crazy. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's fate. That's lovely. You can't write that. <laughs> um, uh, any last remarks from either of you? Um, Carr, thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak. Um, and to have this event, uh, it was lovely. Martin, of course, thank you for being a part of this. It's really nice to have an event with another Louisiana boy. You know, it's uh, when do we get a chance to do that? It's it's rare to uh, to have us both in the same room. <laughs> so um, so it's perfect. I, I think this was my my favorite event um, that I've done. So or that I probably will be doing. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. There you go, as seductive in life as you are in your fiction, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, thank you, Patrick, for writing this book. Um, I encourage everybody, if you haven't already picked it up, here's the thing, you look at this cover, and if you've, if you're, if you've ever been to New Orleans or if you're from there, no one had to tell me this was St. Rock. I've been in this shrine. It's this tiny, low ceiling little shrine with these fragments of human bodies hanging down. And these are all blessed parts, right? People praying for a heart to be healed or a foot to be healed. And that's what your book really is about, right? But here's the thing, if you can't make it to New Orleans, if you're trapped in your house, right, during the time of COVID, you can go there by picking up a copy of this book and reading these stories. Um, it was a trip for me in every sense of the word. So I thank you, Patrick, and I thank you, Carr, for inviting me to join uh, this unholy trinity here. <laughs> thank you both so much. Thank you. This is truly a lovely evening. Thank you, um, everyone out there on the internet for joining us from wherever you are. The power of Zoom brings us across the globe, which is lovely, and to New Orleans and back. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for your considered questions and answers. Uh, we have copies of Martin's book available for sale. We have signed copies of Patrick's book for sale uh, at greenapplebooks.com or come in, come in uh, to the store if you can. Um, thank you both. Congratulations, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night, everybody. <laughs>